for the Gueta good of Uganda. United against both political and Kerese COVID-19. We are taking a step forward to advance what we have always been. United against the misrule. Maybe this time make it more formal and focused. And failing is not one of our options. Ladies and gentlemen, today me and my young flower, our honorable senior. <laughs> Uh, just asking if I don't mind, when she calls me honorable, of course I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> we, shall, we shall leave, just because we are part of the press room. And uh, we are going to say less. I just want to request him to take us through the program, and then we shall call on the person who is supposed to take us on the, at the next level to come here and brief this meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you, Honorable Nagose. You know, for a very long time, Ugandans have been saying, so the forces of change, you are all desirous of change, you want to see a better country. Why is it difficult for you to work together? And uh, today's press conference is an answer to that question, that it's actually very possible for us to unite against injustice, to unite against bad governance, to unite against oppression, to unite against the dictatorship. And uh, we, we have begun, and we are sending that message to Ugandans out there that if as leaders we can be able to do this and say, look, we all want a new Uganda, we all want a better country, do the same out there, wherever it is that you are, and that's why we are here. I'll just quickly introduce, um, especially the leaders that we have here, others will keep going on along the way, so I'll introduce those at the front, and then we'll get started. Uh, I see we have with us the Honorable John Baptist Nambeshe. Uh, all the way from Eastern Uganda, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. We have with us uh, Ambassador Waswa Biriba, he's the chairman of uh, the FTC. You're welcome, sir. We have with us uh, Dr. Lina Zedrika Waru, she's the deputy principal of the People Power Movement. You're welcome, madam. And then our crossover together, uh, we have party leaders. I see four uh, Honorable Patrick. Oh boy, Amriya is the MC today. Welcome, sir. It's okay to clap with you. We have with us John Ken, the man, uh, Honorable Chairman. <laughs> CP. Yes. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether he's very conservative, but yes, he's a, he's a good man. We have with us uh, the Honorable Asman Basariwa. He's the president of JEMA. And he is also the president of iPod. We have uh, with us the Right Honorable Elias Lukwago. He's the Lord Mayor, Kampala Lord Mayor. Several thank you for coming. We are sure you can do your And last but certainly not least, we have our elder, uh, retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Vesijet, the President of the People's Government. So we are going to have um, a document read to us, clearly adumbrating what it is that we are saying, what we want to communicate, what it is that we are uniting about. And, and the clarion call that we are going to make to Ugandans out there. It's going to be read by uh, two people, and we invite the first reader to read the first half of that document. Uh, I think they'll come together. I'm sure they are comfortable with that. The Honorable Asuma Nibasa Alirwa, together with uh, the Lord Mayor. You're welcome. Members of Parliament, 
but we also make a clarion call on the people of Uganda to rise up and defend themselves against the continuing effects of bad governance. The review of the regime's handling of the pandemic. One of the tragedies that one of the tragedies of our country is that President Museveni is running the country as if it is his private home or property. How he has that how he has thus far responded to this pandemic is no different. He has deliberately chosen to micromanage the response from State House as opposed to allowing institutions to function. The civil society, tradition and religious leaders, as well as other stakeholders were locked out of the process. In a functioning democracy, these stakeholders play a very prominent role in ensuring that the government is fully accountable, more so in times like this, where ordinary citizens have been locked up. In Uganda's case, the issues of response and actions were insulated from any form of accountability. In specific terms, we shall highlight a few issues that have been grossly mismanaged. Number one, hunger and starvation. Our people are hungry and starving. Even before the COVID outbreak, the state of food security has been deteriorating, more so in eastern Uganda and parts of northern and central Uganda. The lockdown has only worsened the situation. Although the regime procured a supplementary of 59 million shillings to feed 1.4 million people in Wakiso and Kampala, only a few of them were reached with some little relief, which could only take them for a few days. In a very discriminatory manner, Ugandans in other parts of the country who were similarly under lockdown were not planned for, with the resultant effect that millions of Ugandans are starving. A parliamentary resolution to hold food distribution until government puts in place mechanisms to reach all Ugandans with relief was ignored. When the idea of a district task force was mooted, it was expected that more people outside Kampala and Wakiso would be reached. The reverse has happened. It has largely, it has, it was largely about posturing. The procurement of food and its distribution exercise, even in the few areas highlighted, has been riddled by corruption, with the citizens getting rotten food in many cases. I am aware the Honorable Semunju did present rotten beans in Parliament, and it is on record. The effects of hunger will be long lasting. According to UNICEF, more than one third of all young children in Uganda, close to 2.4 million, are stunted. The damage caused by stunting is irreversible. This was the situation before the outbreak. Instead of prioritizing the future of these malnourished children, the Uganda regime has been passing supplementary budgets in insane amounts for state house, classified defense expenditure, among others. As it normally happens, this money is going to be used for patronage and to procure tools of violence. The Ugandan citizen is on her own. Number two, health. The nature of public health crisis we are faced with necessitates that our analysis begins with the health. The pandemic is being confronted by an underfunded health sector, regional barrel hospitals, which are designated treatment centers, were audited in 2018 and found to be under-equipped and lacking senior medical staff. We share in the public outrage that has been stirred by the wasteful budgeting and ensure and expenditure that has generally characterized the COVID response. Navy District, for instance, is emblematic of this state of affairs. One of the 165 million dispersed, 50% was spent on allowances, 20% on staff welfare, and the remainder on fuel and car tubes. Line institutions such as the Uganda Virus Research Institute have chronically been underfunded and understaffed. One of the 9 million shillings allocated to the Institute in the financial year 2019-2020, only 1 billion was dispersed. 
This means that the preparedness for the crisis, following the breach was available since December 2019, was already fated to get off on a weak start. And surprisingly, on May 12th, Uganda Nurses and Midwives Union warned of industrial action after national medical stores delivered drugs and other supplies without personal protective equipment. The union acted upon their warning and began industrial action on May 20th for lack of allowances and protective equipment. Reports of unpaid medical allowances and even salaries from March through May have circulated in the media. Notwithstanding a presidential directive to provide masks to all Ugandans above the age of six, the Minister of Health has recently told the Parliament that they need a supplementary budget to cover free masks. Given that the figures from April 14 indicates that interstate truck drivers are the primary conduit of the disease, the response to this threat was slow. The presidential directive of May 10, quantity the trucks at points of entry, paying just resources, was only implemented on May 21st after 158 have been allowed entry. These results are now showing COVID-19 cases among their contacts as well as community cases. At the regional level, inability of the East African community leadership to agree upon and implement a common approach on testing, treating and quarantining further stifled containment. This lack of testing protocols and the subsequent discord between members has allowed public and official suspicion about falsification of results between the East African member states. These multiple mishaps raise questions about the Rosa picture created by the National Task Force in its political briefing on the status of the country's fairness and what was being done to stem the spread of the virus. Education. Learners in their many years from primary to tertiary levels would be outside their exams following the relaxation of restrictions on finalists. But most parents are worried. They have been under lockdown and therefore not working. Most of them will not afford school fees, even other scholastic materials such as geometry sets. The government is not saying anything about assisting them in this regard. The failure to, to distribute complete sets of learning materials to all learners countrywide will adversely impact the learning outcomes expected at every stage of the curriculum. Reports that learning materials are being sold have also tainted the integrity of the process. Relatedly, the failure to deliver e-learning as well as the inability to distribute materials for printing in districts, despite the expenditure on the national backbone infrastructure, is an indictment on the management of education at the technical and political levels. Information from the Auditor General shows that about one billion shillings was spent on 78 unused internet connections. Only 445 out of the 20,000 connections are in use. This, in this vital service, the taxpayer and our learners have been <coughs> short chain. Transport. Millions of border border riders in Kampala and elsewhere in the country have had their livelihood disrupted and no relief package for the loss of income suffered and have been extended. The same has been the case for tens of thousands of tax drivers across the country. The scale of desperation becomes apparent if one considers that 20, that 83% of Uganda's labor force is in the government. The scattering of relief food has already been provided to people at the sales face. To add so to injury, the government is putting plans to restrict the tax In the central district in Kampala. Although the regime has denied that they plan to them out, the conditions they are imposing on taxis and border borders have the effect of keeping them out of business, and it is clear that it is the regime's intention. Moreover, 
the operators of these border borders and taxis we are never consulting. The regime, which has always viewed them as a threat, is taking advantage of the lockdown to expand them out of Kampala and therefore out of employment. Landlords, tenants, and the rent question. As far as of change, a presidential directive to the effect that landlords should evict tenants and that a grace period for rent should apply did not, did not go enough to provide a framework or timeline within which areas would be paid. However, it hasn't been backed by statutory instrument and can be legally ignored. There are already reports of eviction. Many landlords themselves owe banks and therefore risk for a closure in the post-lockdown era. The absence of a tangible intervention in this regard spells a chaotic post-lockdown environment. Water, electricity, and other essential services. There has been no waiver or reduction of water or electricity bills, even though these are vital services in this crisis. Although the government indicated that bills wouldn't be paid while the lockdown subsists, our poor and vulnerable people who have been under lockdown will not, will not be able to afford these charges even when the lockdown is eventually lifted. The employment situation and bank loans. Despite the government making a statement requiring employers not to dismiss employees, many Ugandans have lost jobs in this period. Employers have bypassed the directive by the Minister of Labor by resorting to constructive forms of dismissal, such as suspensions. Others have used the pay cuts. The government has not come to their rescue. Similarly, the illegal presidential directive asking banks and lending institutions not to foreclose on loans has been ignored by many banks and other financial institutions to the chagrin of these poor people. Farmers, Poor smallholders in the agricultural industry were left to their own. This reduced demand for their produce. This is only when smallholder farmers and their dependents form 70-80% of the population. Small businesses and social protection. A vast majority of Ugandans are employed in the informal sector. Ugandans who largely survive on small businesses are effectively out of work. They are dependents out of work with their dependents. President Museveni instead said on one more than on more than one occasion that the relief measures are not meant to alleviate poverty, and poverty will be dealt with at a later time. In addition, demands by many Ugandans who have those with NSS savings get part of their money have been roundly rejected by the regime. There is no social security for Ugandans in such a difficult time. Security of person and property. The enforcement of COVID-19 related restrictions has been dated by the surge in brutality by law enforcement agencies with multiple reports of beatings, unlawful detention, and targeted offenses against women. Fatal shootings by the now infamous local defense unit operatives have occurred in a number of locations. Implicated personnel are yet to be brought to book. Many low ranking security personnel have not been paid relevant allowances, even when Parliament passed a supplementary budget for the same. The due process rights of those who have been arrested countrywide continue to hang in balance as the criminal justice system seems to have gone into hibernation. Above all levels, above all, the levels of mismanagement of public funds has never been so high and so callously done. Trillions of Uganda shillings have been passed in supplementary budgets with little or no debate in Parliament. Large amounts of money have been allocated to classified security expenditure without any justification. Our country is not at war to justify such expenditure. Part of the money passed in this period has gone to 
Mr. Museveni's patronage schemes. The country was united in shock as members of parliament allocated themselves 10 million shillings. When the nation protested, Mr. Museveni commanded the MPs to return the money. But went ahead to pay NRM MPs 40 million shillings each. As Ugandans at home were stuck and those abroad unable to return, the political class aligned to the, to the regime, we are in fist mode. The regime has not only been on a spending spree, they have also been on a begging spree. Aside from the 600 million euros borrowed from the European Union on the 30th of January, the regime went on to borrow 491 million US dollars from the IMF on the 7th of May, ostensibly to deal with some balance of payment shortfalls. With the endemic levels of corruption by the, by the regime, the citizens already know where this money will go. Suddenly, it is the people of Uganda who must pay back this money. The regime is not eager to account for the colossal sums of money obtained through donations and grants to deal with the effects of the pandemic. These include 830 million euros from the Irish Embassy, 30 million euros from the European Union, and more than 15 million US dollars from the US mission, 316 US dollars from UN agencies, 2 million US dollars from the Danish Embassy, and 100 million dollars from IGAD, among others. The COVID task force was also transformed into a begging entity instead of providing strategic direction to the country in this period. They have already raised over 27 billion shillings out of their target of 170 billion shillings. They were not ashamed to propose that struggling Ugandans surrender 10,000 shillings per month to the task force. In this regard, we will propose the website to be led by The citizens are poor, hungry, and desperate. The regime is holding on to incredible amounts of money, which must be put to use to improve the lives of our people during and in the post-COVID period. The way forward in the citizens' perspective is as follows. Number one, there is established an institution to guide the country into recovering from the damage. There is established an institution to guide the country into recovering from the damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the, the attendant mismanagement by the regime. The institution, by whatever name it may be called, must be representative in the sense that all stakeholders should be represented. These stakeholders may include the concerned citizens, uh, uh, government agencies, religious institutions, traditional institutions, political formations across the divide, representatives of citizens working in the informal sector, the business community, ETC. The first assignment of the body must be to do a comprehensive audit of the regime's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that there is accountability and probity for money for first spend. The body must be autonomous and non-partisan in the proper sense of the word. It must be analyzed. Two. All vulnerable and poor families 
in all villages of Uganda should get food relief. Over 8 million Ugandans live in abject poverty and they, continue, they have lived in abject poverty, I mean abject poverty before, during and after COVID. Today, the situation has worsened. As we have demonstrated above, in the elaborate back of what given by my brother here, the regime has enough resources at its disposal to ensure that citizens in all districts who are poor and vulnerable receive food from government. The food relief should be sufficient in terms of quantities and quality. We estimate that every individual should get at least half a kilogram of posho and beans per day. That should be the ration, at least for the bare minimum. The children who risk being further malnourished should be given nutritious food. That includes the mothers who are feeding their children. Three, in the alternative to point two above, and in, a, and in order to ensure transparency, vulnerable Ugandans should receive direct cash transfers from the government, as being done in other countries like Kenya. This money should be given to these struggling Ugandans directly as the mechanism may be worked out. The organs, rather, this organ envisaged in this particular poem above should involve designing the mode of delivery of these funds so as to reduce corruption and other abuse. I beg to do this. The organ envisaged in poem number one that non-partisan body should be involved in designing the mode of delivery of these foodstuffs, rather of these funds, so that, so that we reduce corruption and other ills. We propose that each vulnerable family receive a minimum of 100,000 Uganda shillings per week. Number four. Regarding education, the government must ensure that private school owners are sub, sub, subsidized so that they do not charge parents any monies for the upcoming term. So we demand, I mean, we insist there must be subsidies. Likewise, government-aided schools must not charge parents for school fees for the upcoming Term. Universities should also be assisted so that students do not have to pay tuition to complete the semester which was disrupted as a result of the lockdown. The justification is that parents have not been working and therefore cannot afford that exorbitant cost at this particular moment. At this particular moment. Number five, fees for essential services such as electricity and water should be waived for a period of six months. Government, 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 ex, uh, government extend the payment. No, government should extend the payment period for these services until the lockdown is lifted. These bills have now accumulated for most Ugandans and it will take a considerable period of time for many Ugandans to afford this cost. Therefore, water and the electricity bills for the period beginning in March to September 2020 should be completely waived. Government should extend a subsidy to National Water and Sewage Corporation, MEME, and other responsible organizations uh, dealing with utilities to enable them to deal with the deficits accruing to them as a result of this state of affairs. Number six, 
Bodaboda boda riders and taxi drivers should be assisted instead of being ejected out of the central business district and indeed the whole of South Africa. For avoidance of doubt, KCCA, don't look at me as KCCA. For <laughs> <laughs> avoidance of doubt, KCCA and other agencies should immediately block plans of ejecting these countrymen and women out of Kampala. Why we agree that Kampala should be organized, this must be done in a consultative manner. Government must not take advantage of the lockdown to further crush poor people. Besides, Ugandans who use these services must have accessible and affordable alternatives before such drastic measures are taken. Development must not come at the expense of livelihood and the at the expense of the most vulnerable. When public transport opens up, there must be a deliberate policy to assist the owners of border borders and taxis so as to ensure that they do not hike prices to the detriment of poor Ugandans. Seven. Ugandans who have served the money with, with NSSF must be given between 20% to 30% of their money to assist, the, to assist them deal with the effects of the lockdown and the vagaries of the COVID pandemic. NSSF is a social security fund. It does not own this money, but holds it in a trust for the people who save their money and to deal with such situations such as this particular crisis. There must not be any excuse to deny them their hard and money. Eight, tenants should be given a grace period of eight months without paying rent, both for commercial and residential premises. Ugandans have not been working and they are unable to afford paying rent at this material time. Landlords should get interest free loans to be able to stay home afloat. In addition, landlords who earn less than 10 million shillings should be given equivalent cash grants less than what they would have paid in taxes. For the other landlords, the lost income should be treated as a tax deductible expense to their businesses. Property taxes, uh, as well as ground rent, should also be waived to a period of one year because it is unrelated. Bank of Uganda should be cushion and negotiate with the commercial banks to see that all interests on loans are frozen for this particular period. And to see that no Uganda loses their property on account of unpaid bank loans. Related, Ugandans continue to lose jobs in this period. There must be a clear policy aimed at assisting small, small and medium enterprises with interest free loans, tax holidays, ETC, to enable them to stay afloat so as not to be pushed into uh, uh, dismissing their employees because of those financial constraints they may encounter. Nine, Ugandans who have undergone tragedies, such as those affected by floods in Kasese and Gugujo, those displaced by rising water levels on banks of Lake Victoria in Kampala, Wachiso, ETC, those affected by mudslides in the Elgon region, as well as those who were affected by locusts in the northern part of the country, must be assisted one more the other. In the case of mud slides, rising water levels and floods, Ugandans who have been displaced must be resettled in decent accommodation in a very short time possible. 10. Agriculture being the backbone of our country, measures should also be taken to sustain. The farmers of Uganda must be assisted and must be given priority in the COVID and post-COVID agenda. Measures to improve productivity and ensure that their produce get market at competitive prices 
must be considered as a matter of priority. Now we move to the Gladion Court, largely to the citizens of Uganda. With this state of affairs, we the forces who have assembled here, coming together as a pro-democracy, with this state of affairs, we the forces that have assembled here, coming together as pro-democracy forces, to call upon the people of Uganda to rise up and defend themselves against a regime which has used the COVID-19 situation to enrich itself at the expense of Ugandans and to entrench itself further. Given the significance of this, state, of this line, allow me to repeat this. With this state of affairs, we, the forces that have assembled here, coming together as a pro-democracy force do call upon the people of Uganda to rise up and defend themselves against a regime which has used the COVID-19 situation to enrich itself at the expense of all Ugandans and to entrench itself further in power. It is the money they have borrowed or illegally passed in supplementary budgets, budgets that they are spending on buying political opponents and engaging in early the region of election. We are now therefore announcing that we shall lead Uganda in a range of non violent activities aimed at changing the status quo, but most importantly, ensuring that the above stipulated way forward These activities will begin with a campaign that are you there? Raise your voice. Let's hear you out in Uganda. Jemuri. We must have our voice to be heard. Rise up and defend your rights. Assert yourself. We shall request all Ugandans to hit anything that makes noise so that you are hurt. Whether it's suspect, blowing a whistle, putting with a border border or taxi or anything that can make a noise, even if it is your shoe, do it. For those who feel hungry and want food, we shall request you to bang your empty saucepans with a fork, knife, or a spoon in front of your house or other dwelling places. The citizens will raise their voices in unison and go on to carry out other violent activities until their rights are restored. Not violent. Did I say violent? Yeah. Was it a simple tongue? The script here reads non violent. Yeah. The citizens will raise their voices in unison and go on to carry out other non violent activities until their rights are restored, are respected, and observed. And given the sanctity they deserve. This activity shall begin tomorrow, Tuesday, the 16th of June. So we are, we are saying, with effect from tomorrow, you should swing into action and say, Muriwa, let me repeat it here. We want to hear you out. Say enough is enough. We must go front and take on the bull by its horns. For God and my country. The United Forces, together we shall overcome with the United Forces of Change. May God bless you and I thank you.